Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 35. My name is Zeki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, good to be back. Um, we are... Uh, it's been... It hasn't been a while. We've it, had it, some... It, it, well, it has been a while for people who are listening. <laughs> I know. I feel like we've... You're we're... disturbing the illusion yeah, that we've that's created. True. That's true. That's true. Um, absolutely. Um, but, um, yeah, I actually wanted to kind of... Uh, we've been a little remiss in... Uh, reading some feedback and comments and letters we've gotten. So. We've, we've been getting a whole host of emails, yeah. a lot of new reviews up on iTunes, and first of all, we're very appreciative of all the feedback that you send us. Always. We, we read every email. We we pat ourselves on the back for inspiring those emails, and then, and yeah. then uh, we, we make plans to read them on episodes, and then several episodes go by and we don't do it. That's right, that's right. But In this fact- is it. This is the time. <laughs> The moment is now. This one really touched me. I, this was, you know, and uh, I, in fact, I shared this with my wife and just kind of really humbled by this. Um, the email says, uh, Assalamu alaikum, Prabhaz and Zaki. My name is Ibrahim uh, uh, Asker. I wanted to write you and let you know how much I love and appreciate you both for your podcast, Diffuse Congruence. MashaAllah, you know, God praise. It is awesome. I deliver email. I deliver mail. In the New Orleans area, and listening to you guys keeps me entertained and informed while I'm out on the street making my deliveries. Today I played podcast roulette and landed on some of your guests, your get your guys' first episodes with Gamran Pasha and Rehan Jalali, which were both great. Those are deep cuts. <laughs> deep cuts, nice. nice. Yeah. Uh, may Allah reward you both with goodness. Thank you for all the stuff you do. As a Muslim second generation Palestinian blue collar American. A lot of hyphens there. Um, who is a big fan of your show? I wanted to let you know that you are appreciated. Have a great weekend, brothers. Sincerely, uh, Ibrahim Usker. Well, thank there you, you Ibrahim. Kind of like I said, I was. We were deeply humbled by your email. Really, kind of blew me away. Um, and the misses. So thank you. See, I showed that to my wife, and she's just like, "Yeah, whatever. Take out the trash." <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Keeps keeps me humble. Thank you. Keeps me humble. That's right. Um, another great one. Um, this is via iTunes. Uber. We need some German here. Ubermensch Doppelganger. Okay. Nice. I'm not an American. Okay. I'm like a Superman villain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Superman villain. There you go. Uh, which we haven't talked about the movie. Anyway, I'm not an American. Have only visited the country a few times. I don't have a direct contact with the American Muslim community. Or any other community for that matter. And yet, and yet the monthly or so ruminations and pontifications of this delightful podcast. Do we ruminate and pontificate? We do. Okay. Sorry. Of this delightful podcast bring you a semblance of joy and ensemble to my otherwise mundane car rides from my workplace. Wow. This guy's a poet. Mm. <laughs> or great. he or she. The lineup of guests and subject <laughs> matter is a good eclectic mix which is something for everyone to feel. I must confess there are times that I, when I continue to listen to a podcast after reaching my destination. The language style of the host and measured nature of the conversation is pleasing and oftentimes humorous. Only oftentimes. You know, up your game, Zucky. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but perhaps their biggest <laughs> achievement is to familiarize the unfamiliar. Wow. Muslim Americans to the rest of the, to the, rest of the world. And Americans to the rest, and Americans to the rest of the world, that is quite an achievement, Hussein Qadri. Wow! I know. I'm like floating five <laughs> inches above. This is great. I'm gonna put, paste that to my bathroom mirror. <laughs> exactly. And right. Read it every morning. So to bring us back to this mortal coil, then, um, I personally, and I know Zaki, you are too, but we are totally delighted to have with us. Dr. Miraj Mohyuddin, who is a personal fan, friend, uh, and he, he says he's a fan of the show, but I always introduce him as, or I always introduce myself as a fan of his. So why don't you do the honors and introduce Dr. Miraj to the show? Well, Dr. Miraj Mohyuddin is an American physician and writer, the son of Indian immigrants. He was raised on the East Coast with a strong emphasis on sports and education. With a college background in neuroscience and a medical degree from Northwestern University, he moved to Boston to complete his training in anesthesiology and critical care medicine. 
While teaching at Harvard Medical School and its affiliated hospitals, Dr. Mahideen developed an interest in international relief work and created a curriculum to encourage young American doctors to share their skills in the developing world. And he's here now to talk to us about his new book, Revelation. Dr. Mahideen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm trying not to laugh here while you guys are bantering because first time caller, long time fan, so... Um, <laughs> That's the deeply honored wow. yeah. for you to be even no, saying that. No, that's amazing. It's, totally. Uh, can, can I just begin with my own reflections? Please. Can I send an email to you guys about this show? Sorry? <laughs> can I send my <laughs> no, email? It's, like it's, a a live email. email. it's a live email. How about that? So I have to tell you, these people are on point. Mm. And I just wanted to... It's, it's funny. I'll tell you real quick how I got introduced to Diffuse Congruence. Please. So, you know, hearing your voices is kind of magical just to see the magic happen. Right. So, first of all... my. my I didn't realize that the music is actually played live. So I don't know if you know this, but that that electric guitar riff yeah. is actually um, <laughs> part of it. What happens in the studio with his mouth is he's, he's like um, Michael Winslow. Zucky actually puts on a Darth Vader mask, and Parvez, he just conducts the music with a lightsaber, and Parvez just rocks it out with an electric guitar. So it's just it's magical I wish, in here. I wish, but I wish. Um, yeah. but this is what happened. I, Parvez and I we met like a year ago. Yeah. And you're the one who introduced me to the podcast. He said, hey, I've been doing this podcast. The following weekend, I had to go to a medical conference in Las Vegas. And I swear, you texted I me. had yeah. my headphones in the entire weekend wow. listening to, I kind of binged on the podcast, like 10 episodes straight during medical lectures. And when there was an interesting slide I actually had to learn about, I'd pull one earplug out, listen to the speaker, and then put it back in and continue to like listening. So I am... Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm a binge. I'm a binger. I'm That's amazing. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's wow. powerful stuff. So I'm, I'm completely honored to, yeah. to be a part of something special like this. No, thank you. Um, thank you for saying that. I hope it wasn't anything too critical. Where if I ever have to undergo surgery, <laughs> I'll make sure you're not my anesthesiologist. Or you, you missed that day in class. Like, thank you for being a fan. <laughs> yeah. Can I have another doctor? <laughs> Can I get a second? Appreciate opinion? you listening, but <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, no, so, and you know, it's funny because while you were reading the bio, I was thinking about this. We've often kind of joked about the fact that, I mean, being children of immigrants ourselves, Indian immigrants, um, and there's always obviously the, the, oh, the, 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 the drive and the desire of our parents for us to become doctors and engineers, which both of us sorely, we're, we're sore disappointments for our I was parents. about to say, I was like, I know my folks are going to be listening to this and they're right. going to be like, look at everything he did. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so no but we've often joked about not ha ha in spite of that or coming from that background we've never had actually a, a doctor on the show an actual medical a bona fide medical physician is that true like a, a physician like a, like a like an MD doc no an MD doc we've had professors yeah, and PhDs sure sure um, you know that's true um, but we've never you know to quote Azur Osman you know we've had the poor hungry doctors we haven't had the money doctors we haven't had the money doctors right exactly <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> We're embarrassing. We're right. breaking down barriers on this. <laughs> and show. the irony, no, but, but ironically enough, though, Mirage <laughs> isn't on the show to talk about his medical background, although he's welcome to do so. Uh, I'm more excited, however, to hear about uh, or and have the audience hear about, um, for those who don't know already, about his new book, Revelation. So, I mean, if you want to attend, maybe kind of tell your story, sort of, uh, and how that sort of yeah, intersects. I mean, with, I mean tell yeah. us, tell us about the the lead up to the book, and the mm -hmm. book is about. A topic that is is pretty critical to, to all of us, and not only that, it's critical to sort of the American Muslim experience as we talk about, which mm -hmm. is which is summing up and and enlightening people about the life uh, of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and and that's something obviously that all of us here have been in the position of having to answer questions about, mm. and so certainly the fact that you you felt moved to turn this into a text that could be be a learning artifact. I mean that that's indicative of drive on your part that that's extremely admirable, but I mean what led up to that? So I think the one word I'd boil it down to is frustration. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the way when I go around the country and kind of explain my story, you know, it basically begins like I said I had a very um, I had, uh, alhamdulillah, you know, a, a, a fantastic upbringing. And my parents were incredibly um, supportive of making sure we, we excelled academically. It was paramount in our household that we had our tradition, we respected our tradition, you know, a good character. And then number two, right up there is no A-minuses. 
And then right up there too is like make sure you're playing varsity sports and staying busy, just being active. So that was the kind of the upbringing we had. So we always were just pushing, pushing, pushing academically. We didn't have all these structured um, curricula that you have now of like Baina and Khalam Foundation, all of these kind of um, Islamic, American Islamic, you know, educational forums where people can really kind of start owning their tradition outside right. of their household or the local Sunday school. And right. we actually didn't even have Sunday school where we grew up. My brother and I were the only two Muslims in a high school of 1,600 kids. Ah. So that's kind of the environment that we grew up in. We still had, still had a strong identity. You know, we were the ones who were just fasting all through soccer, soccer season. And, and when was this? Yeah, and where is this? Uh, this is in New Jersey. Okay. So in southern New Jersey, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And we're talking about... Um, you know, I'm 38 now, so we're talking about the, you know, the 80s into the 90s. Sure, sure. I was in high school in the early 90s, around the Nirvana time. Sure. And so forth, Pearl Jam era. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so uh, you know, you know, um, I was always surrounded by all these cousins who were doing amazing things academically, so it was just really a high bar that we kind of had to kind of pursue. And so... Uh, I ended up uh, just go- going through kind of the path that was I was just expected to go through. Went to um, undergrad and did really well and went on to medical school at Northwestern. And all this time, it was always just like academics, academics, academics. And, you know, I was very... I was very involved in in my the Muslim Students Association and so forth as an activist and very aware and I used to read a fair amount but there was a moment I had that where this whole journey began uh, in 2003 in the summer of 2003 when I was studying for my um, my licensing exams for medical school and for to become a physician a licensed physician and I remember just being incredibly frustrated because I was sitting at the Loyola Library in downtown Chicago at this desk and I had probably a stack of eight books next to me and I was just piling through them and I remember looking at these books like Microbiology, Ridiculously Simple, or Epidemiology books, First Aid for the Boards. I mean anyone who's in medicine who's listening to this right now knows exactly what I'm talking about because they're probably staring at those books right now themselves. (laughs) Um, And uh, I just remember uh, just the fact that I actually had completely mastered these texts. So if you opened up to any page and said, tell me something about meningitis or tell me about endocarditis, I could tell you exactly what the figure looked like and what the caption said. Um, I just complete. I had to own the material to, to do well. Right. And I developed the skill set to learn that material. And it just occurred to me that my my understanding of my faith con- continued to remain at this elementary level, mm. despite my best efforts, or what right. I thought at that time were my best efforts. And I was just frustrated that I didn't, um, at that age, with everything that, that had been poured into me from my parents and the community and so forth, I don't know that I had actually read the entire Quran cover to cover. Wow. And I'm not... Um, a few years ago, to be honest with you, I would be embarrassed to say that publicly, but I actually am finding that um, that's that statement's tending to resonate with a lot of people. I Absolutely, sure. yeah. I can relate um, to it. And I think what you just sharing your experiences. I mean, I, I think you speak to such a large chunk of the American Muslim mm. population. Certainly, I think children of immigrants who came. Yeah. Here. I mean, you know, I, I'm finding I, I hear myself in your story. Mm. You know, mm. and and you're talking about. 2003, you said. Yeah. 2003. So it's a couple of years after 9/11. Yes. Mm. Yes. I mean, how, I mean, and this is this is a question that we come back we to do. again and again. Yeah. I mean, what role did that play in sort of formation of identity and and you know uh, on this path? So I would say, you know, personally for me, 9/11, I I would say uh, um, I didn't have that kind of identity that I didn't have that moment of who am I and what's my role. I think you know I was blessed with a strong enough identity moving into 9-11 that it didn't occur to me it didn't make me question for example what my faith says I knew very clearly this had nothing to do with what was going on and it was just a very complex issue of mm. what actually happened um, so to be honest with you it didn't affect me spiritually at all it was kind of just um, um, it was like an annoyance to like my daily routine as mm. it were you have to now deal with the Sure. The specter of suspicion and so forth. But even then, to be honest with you, I mean, life is pretty 
I mean, right. you know, it no, wasn't that bad for me. I'll no, be honest absolutely. with you. I'm just being honest. As a physician, I was just busy. I was more worried about the fact that uh, I'm on call, I'm post call, and no one's getting me out of the hospital and I can't go home and I'm exhausted. Those are the kind of yeah. issues I was dealing with sure. at the time, to be totally honest with sure. you. Sure. Um, you know, at this time, 2003, I had left Chicago, and this is when I had gone to Harvard to start my, my training, mm-hmm. and it was just so intense. That whole period was kind of like a blur to me. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to learn anesthesia and get through medicine and try not right. to kill anybody on the long. You know, it's one of right. those kind of, those are the, the, the concerns of a resident, you know, they're usually <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah. Those go are the beyond the halls of the hospital months. kind of right. thing. Right. Um, but that being said, uh, as certainly I'm sure there are probably, I'm not, you know, there are probably some subconscious motivations in that where, if, you know, how am I really owning my Americanness, mm. and that's something maybe we can get into a little sure, bit later sure, on sure. the podcast. But mm. but um, but yeah, go back to the kind of like yeah, the, you you sort of mastered or yeah, you mastered the the medical sciences yeah. and the medical subjects that you were you had to get you had to know for your yeah. boards, and felt that you were at the same time maybe lacking or bereft in terms of your yeah how is it that I haven't haven't yeah. read the Quran and there you know in the example right. I give for example yeah. is like I said I can tell you anything about meningitis or right. I could at that time now mm-hmm. most anesthesiologists can't tell you much I mean I shouldn't <laughs> I shouldn't belittle my entire career but right. we'll save your life we just can't tell you about meningitis but um, uh, that being said yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know at that time I just I said you know I and this is you know I had grown up my mother had sat by my side uh, since I was like six years old uh, just watching me go through the Quran over and over and over. Nice. And so, so I had passed through it and, you know, I just used this example the other day in the talk. You know, we had memorized Surah Yasin, which is considered the heart of the Quran in terms of the chapter of the Quran at a very early age. But had you asked me at in my early 30s, tell me what the major themes of the heart of the Quran are, I couldn't tell you. Sure. And if you even asked me at that time, tell me about those small set of surahs at the end of the Quran, what are they really about? And the period of which they were revealed, and what were they speaking to the people of the time in early Mecca? I couldn't tell you. Mm-hmm. And we recite these every day. That's right. And it was just that kind of frustration where I could, again, I could tell you so much about stuff that I'll never really use in my life, and I can't tell you the stuff that I use every day in my life. So I decided I need to get to the Quran, and I need to master this text the way I've at least attempt to master it with the with the intensity and the skill sets that I've used to kind of. Uh, pursue my academic careers and so for me it was a question of how do I do this and my choices at that point the way they had presented themselves to me is that I can either go the route of the language and really study the Arabic language like some of my friends had done who had gone to Middlebury in Vermont or gone this was the time again before Fawaki Institute and all these Arabic institutes here in America stateside you were limited Limited yeah, completely, yeah, yeah. So, and at that point, it wasn't really the right time, especially after 9-11, to go abroad, and I was doing my residency, so it just, it go. wasn't, it wasn't practical, so I decided if I can't go the route of the Arabic, let me try something else, let me try to study the, the, the context of Quranic revelation, so yeah. what is the story behind the story, you know, mm. behind the scenes thing, and maybe that'll give me a sense of what was being revealed, and so that is, in essence, is what uh, is the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, otherwise known as the Sira. Mm-hmm. The Sira is a path, and so this is the path of the Prophet. And so I said, let me just try this. <laughs> um, it's pretty easy, and the, 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 the really cool thing about studying biographies, most biographies, is that you don't need any prerequisite to study anyone's biography. Right. You know, you can pick up a book about Abraham Lincoln and not know anything about what was going on and still enjoy it and draw a lot out of it. You don't need to know economics or have a background in sociology. And the same thing with, with the Islamic sciences. I always tell people there's no, you know, I'm biased, but I think most scholars would agree there's no more beautiful topic to study than the life of our messenger. Hmm. Um, and there's no prerequisite. I didn't need to know any grammar or morphology or any... Uh, basic creed is just get into it okay. and with open heart and just give it your all. And so right. I went that route and so I started with Martin Ling's book, which is probably one of the most renowned books. And um, I was really excited, but by like page four, I was getting pretty tired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, you know, this again, it's, they're over, you know, it's an interesting factor. They're over about 17 or 18 people in Martin Ling's named Abdullah. And there's yeah. some people who are named Abdullah ibn Abdullah. Right. So it's just kind of a confusing mess really fast. Um, Similar to what... Uh, we had a previous guest on our show talk about that uh, as a non-Muslim at that time. I know going to about. Barnes & Noble. I know. Yeah, I know yeah. the story. And picking up Martin Ling's <laughs> thinking, okay, this is a good starting point. 
because uh, someone has told me about this prophet. And saying exactly yeah, that. Yeah, and that saying the exact same so... thing. By page two, <laughs> all the Abdullahs, he was lost. So this is what's so ironic. I was actually, I know this, I remember this, I was standing in the hotel lobby in Las Vegas, like I told you, yeah. listening to Mustafa Deva's podcast right. when he is telling this story about how he went and pulled up Martin Ling's and he was just bouncing off of it. Hmm. And I said, wow. I, and this is a thing, you know, I said, I ultimately decided uh, as this book went along, I said, I wanted to write the book that I wish I had 20 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And this it's is amazing. turning out to be that book it for is. me personally. Yeah, sure. And I, when I heard Mustafa Davis say that, I said, you know what? I wasn't there for him, but I hope I can be there for the, for the next guy, inshallah, wow. God willing. Yes. So it's kind of fascinating they did that. So, yeah. so long story <laughs> short, you know, I started this journey with Martin Lings and then I kind of just completely deconstructed the book just sure. blew it apart you know i created the glossary of all these names and you know at that point it was interesting i was driving to evanston hospital where i was doing my internship and i was listening to the cd set of uh, sheikh hamza yusuf who had his life of the prophet cd set it's an amazing cd set i'd recommend everyone listen to it um, who's interested in studying this material and in cd5 track one he says quote you know it'd be really nice if someone just wrote down all the names because the names are difficult. Yeah. And it'd be really nice if someone wrote that down. That would be really helpful. Yeah. And, and provide an index. And provide an index. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I was already interested in this before yeah. he suggested it, and he just threw down a gauntlet. <laughs> Why can't I be the guy to do it? Mm, and wow. that, and I attribute him really to as the inspiration for this book. I really, I mean, I have so much to be grateful for for a lot of the giants who have put us in this position where we can just collect the fruits of the trees that they have planted. Certainly. Um, and he is certainly one of uh, my mentors, even though he might not know how much of a mentorship role he's had for me from a distance. Wow. But um, So a time grew 12 books later, 13 years later, I've gone through my own ups and downs in life, you know, the challenges of work and, and so forth, family, and ultimately moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and finally just finished the book this year. Mm. Yeah. So this is the book, this is the year. Of the book. Well, I've been saying that for yeah. the last four years, but luckily this is actually the year. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. something people don't know is that this is actually the fourth edition of the book. The first three editions just weren't good enough to get to print. I just felt like we have to make this better. So we actually thought we'd publish this. My goal is to publish this before my first child was born, like three years ago, and we've just been powering through it because we just keep thinking better, we make ways to make it better and better. There you so, go. There you go. Yeah. Um, so you, I mean, there's a lot to, to unpack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we that's, were a, that's a favorite word. If, if, for those of you longtime listeners, we're going to start the unpacking process now of diffuse congruence. Uh, <laughs> no, so I, I, having heard you tell the story mm. on some of your presentations that you do uh, in conjunction to the book, what 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 I what I found interesting is one that your journey to the or your impetus for the book mm -hmm. wasn't, and I don't mean to I'm not saying this to to, to okay let, let me just say say what I want to say rather than trying to put any kind of caveats around it. Uh, it. The impetus for the book is not the subject matter of the book. What I mean by that is mm -hmm. your desire you you're, you write about the Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad. But in the life of the Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad, the Sirah, as you said, mm -hmm. um, but but however, the, the impetus for the book is you felt a lacking in terms of your relationship with the Quran. Yes. And so, rather than say, okay, I'm going to take the Quran as my mm -hmm. subject matter, mm -hmm. you chose the Sirah. Yeah. And you touched on it, but why? Like, what for our listeners and for for our sake, for our benefit, like what what did you feel was that? Um, why you know the hmm. the uh, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. The, the connection. Absolutely. So I think the like cognate. I, if you I think that was right? a great question. I actually I'm I'm glad you asked that because people often ask me why if you wrote a book about Muhammad the yeah. messenger why did you call the book Revelation? And the great. great and one. it's like a great kind of flip on what you just asked. That is. And uh, um, the whole point is to get to the Quran. That was my whole purpose, and I'm glad you kind of highlight that because sometimes we kind of forget to mention that. Um. And th again, this was just, how do I get to the history of it? And it was just, it happened to be through this person. There's really no other way to understand the context of how the Quran was revealed until you understand the lives and the struggles of a person and a community during a very specific period of time in 7th century Arabia. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that my journey took me in that direction. Once I kind of got to this fork in the road between Arabic versus historical context, and I took the route of the historical context, I just started falling down this path, and I sure. had to go here. 
what ended up happening was kind of interesting is that, you know, I kind of, to be honest, you know, I was approaching as an academic project. Uh, I was hoping it would make me, you know, increase my conviction, but it was really kind of with this academic bent of let me like do figures and graphs and family trees and really master the material. What I didn't realize what was going to happen is it ended up mastering my heart. Mm. And um, this is kind of a journey that um, I'm in a place right now that I never expected I would be in right now. I never expected that I would be in Northern California talking to the two of you right now, or the fact that I'd be able to be introduced to the peoples of the likes of you, or to get to know the communities of Ta'lif and the, the, the work that I think is so incredibly important right now. This is all part of this journey that was kind of unexpected for me. Right, right. Um, so but, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back to the sort of what you're doing now yeah. kind of thing, which is, you know, I think, so you're doing these series of presentations mm-hmm. at various communities, book launches, if right, you will. Right. But, but to go back to, yes. the, to the actual book, so, you, you know, and, 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 and you, you again, you touched on it, but like you know, the the fact that you call the book Revelation, yes. yet it's about the Prophet Muhammad, which of course that that itself sort of lends itself to why you write the book and 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 what the impetus was. So I think you know, kind of borrowing from the sentiments of one of my mentors and the scholar who wrote the the forward uh, to my book, uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson, who's. Uh, a giant in I think all of our eyes in the room right now you know I know he was your mentor also yeah. and he's just you know there is a very specific reason why I picked Dr. Sherman Jackson I think uh, that story itself is fascinating so okay we can go there yeah, for yeah, a yeah, second yeah, yeah. I actually came and that's when we met yeah, that's is that, right that's you know right. It, it Dr. Jackson is not the kind of guy you can just call up and say hey although he will speak he will hang out with you in that so, way I mean so. he's he's just everyone wants his time and okay. his attention because of who he is and so it's been a long um, journey to even get him, uh, just to get in front of him and just to explain to him uh, what I'm trying to do. And the reason why I specifically chose him uh, to kick off this book is because, A, he's a scholar and he's someone who I think more than, certainly more than me to help people orient themselves before they dive into this project. But I feel that he complete, he very um, authentically understands the American experience and authentically understands the Islamic, the Muslim tradition, the scholarly tradition, and can speak to both. Um, and in that way, you know, he says, and it's, it's it, if nothing else, just read his read his uh, forward, you know, and then you know, no. the book is worth the forward, I, I would say to people. But um, he says you cannot, you know, in his very beginning of his thing, he says you for those people, you know, pe- the, he says the Quran is going to become, if not already, the most widely read book. It will become the most widely read book. Specifically because of what we are dealing with in the world today. Right. For better or for worse, it's like, you know, any pub- publicity is good publicity is kind of what they say. Everyone's kind of picking this book and trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And he says very specifically, whether you speak Arabic or you don't speak Arabic, it's still going to be potentially a jumble for you if you don't understand the delivery vehicle and through which the Quran came, and that is through the life of the Prophet mm-hmm. Muhammad. Mm-hmm. And so his emphasis is on you have to understand the context of every verse because if you don't you're taking it totally out and we see we're seeing what's happening when people are completely taking it out of context um and so um for me that's what became very powerful is that i didn't recognize the world into which the quran was revealed Mm -hmm. i had this completely oversimplified sepia version black and white image of what it was like to be arabia but to get into it and to study it in its full technicolor vividness and Mm -hmm. to understand people's political alliances, to understand that greed was just as alive then as it is now, to understand that they are dealing with an oligarchy that we're dealing with now, to understand that they have special, they had super PACs, like we have super PACs now, I mean, figuratively speaking, right. special um, they had the top 1% there, and the games, the rules are rigged there, to understand the erosion of tribal Arabia, just like we have the erosion of the most beautiful, like, American, you know, like, southern hospitality. We're seeing, I, I, I feel like I'm witnessing the erosion of some of the most beautiful right things of what American we call classic, culture, classical, classical Americana. Americana. Right, and we're seeing the erosion of The that. erosion of those things, too. They were dealing with the same issues. And, and so, in that regard, to see it, for me, is helping the Quran actually come to life. Because they're dealing with real realities um, of 7th century Arabia, which are equally uh, parallels in, in America today. So, so I mean, like, delving into the book now mm-hmm. itself, I mean, you know, one of the things that anybody who opens the book will find is that it's 
it's it's it, it, it's it's like a modern textbook. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks like and reads like a modern textbook, mm-hmm. and I don't. I, that's certainly not a a negative. And I say that out of uh, sort of a couch praise of the book because I think that you get the Western reader because you are one. Yeah. And you get the Western mind because again you are one. You know you you, you that that is the uh, that is your milieu from which mm-hmm. you come from. Mm-hmm. But to to I think that is to me the game changer that the book presents mm. is that the book presents the Sierra in a way that is so accessible to the Western reader. Sure. And that's because of the fact that, you know, yeah, Martin Ling's book and you know you know. Allah Yarham, God bless him, and and the effort, and and it, and 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 other books like it, Karen Armstrong's book, they they're wonderful prose, mm. but what they lack are the sort of again the illustrations, the, the 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 charts and the graphs and the tables and all the kind of connections you draw visually. Mm-hmm. So talk about that. I mean, is that do you think do you think come, some of that comes from your own sort of medical training? Absolutely. I mean, I think, right? you know, people, you know, to be very clear, just up front is that, you know, I don't consider myself a scholar, in, you know, in, in uh, the Islamic sciences at all, because I'm not. But what I am good at is I'm really good at, um, like, anyone who goes through, you know, rigorous training, it's not a medical thing, or, you know, any, anything is that just getting to huge volumes of information, and b- breaking it down to what are the essentials I need to know to really start mastering this, right. and then how do I put it all back together, and then see the big right. picture. Again. Oh, I, and I forgot to mention mnemonics, which is another device mnemonics, you use correct. a lot. So, talk a little bit about that. That's what I, I really wanted you to talk about. Yeah, the... Okay, so, um, so for me, your, the issue was... The, so, I guess the approach to the book, you know? So, the mean? approach to the book. So, yeah. basically, you know, so, like I said, this was a 13-year journey, and about seven years into it, I had kind of dissected all the information. And imagine, just figuratively, I had like this table full of just notes, cards all over the place. That's kind of the way my brain was looking at that time. And I could pick up any individual note card and be like, oh yeah, I know this material, and put it back. But if you ask me to find this other note card in your brain, it was kind of hard to retrieve stuff. Because the interesting thing about the, the life of the Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that we probably know more about him than pretty much any other person in human history. Sure. So it's be- incredibly rich that we know that much, but it's also challenging. And that's what I, you know, I make an analogy with, with Ling's. I say Ling's, uh, Mar- Dr. Uh, Martin Ling's book is incredible mm-hmm. resource because it's so rich. Yeah. And the analogy I kind of make is, um, it's kind of, I mean, not to make this analogy about the subject matter itself, but if you read Tolkien, for example, yeah. sure. um, it's probably one of, it's to, to for me, it still remains part of the best work of fiction I've ever read in my lifetime, and partly because when I'm in the Shire, I am in the Shire. That's right. You know, I don't recognize that there are airplanes flying over me because I'm in the book, but when I close it, it's it's so good because the details are so vivid, right. but it's also so hard to remember because the details are so vast, mm. and that's how I feel a lot of times. And, and it's a deep dive if you're going in, like if you read Lord of the Rings first. Yeah, it's a lot to. It's like going into the deep end of the pool. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And so, but it's hard to remember, well, who was Gandalf and how was he related to, you know, I mean, the, these relationships are so rich and beautiful, but it's hard to hold. And the same thing I find with, with, with Martin Lynch, you dive into it and you just don't want to leave. But when you close the book, you know, three months later, wait, who was uh, yeah. someone's? Yeah. And so I said enough with this. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that, you know, that book was, is, continues to be appropriate, but that was really appropriate for a time. Just like, for example, old English translations of the Quran were maybe appropriate at that time, but they're not really resonating with the language of today. So in the same way, I need to study this. All the stuff that I've mastered has come from books that are very um, aesthetically nice. The mm-hmm. font selection is good. Uh, they're multicolored. There's a like good, smart infographics. There's no wasted paper on just information that's interesting but not useful. Everything should be efficient and useful. Mm. I'm used to studying from glossaries, charts, maps, you know, because one one image can show like 10 pages worth of information in one image. And what I'm finding right now for myself is I don't have the time. You know, that's something I think we're all dealing with. I really want to own my tradition, but between taking call and then coming home and helping my wife change a diaper, it's time to go to bed. And it's like, it's hard to dive in. So... I wanted to create the perfect, I mean, close to what would be helpful for me to master the text. There you go. And so that's what I developed. Is So in, in year eight, I said, I have all these note cards all over the table. Yeah. How do I figure out a way to like 
know this and know where every note card is on the table. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I devised this system. It took me three weeks um, in the summer of 2010. And I said, I'm not moving forward with this book until I come up with a way to learn every major event that happened in the Sierra in a way that I can always own for the rest of my life. Right. Now, this part is my favorite, but it's, 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 it, it needs a visual aid. So we can't do it over a podcast. But maybe as vividly as you can, kind of yes. describe that for us. So... The the story of what I, what I tell people, you know, the, the story is the prophet, peace be upon him, was 63 years old. And um, his first 40 years were as a period before he, he lived three, for 63 years. 63 so years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his first uh, uh, 40 years are yeah. the era of pre-prophethood period of his life. Right. And at age 40, we believe, around, um, he got received his first revelation. So the period of Quranic revelation actually goes from age 40 <laughs> all the way until age 63. So the Quran was actually revealed over a 23-year period. And the whole mission of Islam, an incredible story, uh, happened over a 23-year period, which right. is actually mind-blowing because it's no I, I don't know, you know, it's been said by Muslims and non-Muslims that you know no one's being able to achieve what has been achieved politically and religiously and so forth in such a short period of time. Right. So this 23 year period of time, it's a busy time and a lot happened in these 23 years. And so the question was, how do I memorize everything that happened in these 23 years? Okay. And so I um, started working on timelines and I did linear timelines and I said, what if I draw this timeline as a rectangle and break it down to pieces? And ultimately what I stumbled upon um, is I came up with this thing which I call the chronic year timeline. And it's a circular timeline which helps you understand spatio-temporally. Can I use that word? Please. Spatio -tem I just think I just, I don't even know that's a real word. But no, it is. Okay, I mean, spatio -temporally. Let's unpack it a little bit. <laughs> let's unpack that, yeah. Um, but it's a timeline that allows you to visualize on one piece of paper all four of the periods, major periods of chronic revelation, which I broke down to, which are the early Meccan period, the right. late Meccan period, the early Medinan period, late Medinan period. And what's interesting is each one of those quadrants of, imagine a, a pie that yeah. you cut into four pieces. There you go. Each one of those quadrants actually represents a significant theme. Right. So, for example, the early Meccan period is a period of, in, uh, you know, the, the earliest um, chapters. If you're staring at the pie, you're looking at the top right quad top quadrant, right quadrant right now. Yeah. And that's early Meccan. So imagine like Second, if you're looking at a clock. Yeah, I love A that. regular clock. So imagine it's a 24-hour clock. There you go. Okay, so normally a clock is 12 hours. So a normal clock, the quadrants would be 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's a 24-hour clock, imagine the clock is 1 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 18 o'clock, and then back up to 24 o'clock. So now it's a 24-year timeline there you go and so what's interesting about that is that basically and it's just amazing the way it worked out for me is that it works out so that at every point at at uh, 1 6 12 and 18 you have like the pivotal event that that um brings in the next um right. quadrant and it begins with the letter h and it begins so, with the letter right. h so <laughs> without giving too much away because no sorry. one's gonna buy no i'm teasing you no no, no. but you, you have know, to see it to believe it. Yeah, you know, we'll you hopefully get, get a video out to do that. But, you know, I'll, I'll say that. So each yeah. quadrant begins with an H. So, for example, the, <coughs> the early Meccan period, the clock starts with the cave of Hera, which is the name of the place where Muhammad received his first revelation. And that uh, ushers in the early Meccan period with the early Meccan surahs, which are really stressing uh, monotheism, a return to monotheism, a return to the practice of taking care of other people and inner you know, purification. And, you know, it, it, you know the, the people of Mecca, the, the, the Muhammad's clan of Quraysh are just not happy with this message. Just like people might not be happy on Wall Street if I go and just tell them, you know what, I think you guys need to start worrying about Main Street and not Wall Street. You know, it's just an unpopular message in certain parts of, of America. Same Feel with, the burn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that we're yeah. endorsing anybody. <laughs> Hey, but we're not um, like a non-profit or something, and we have some legal restrictions. <laughs> yeah. Right. So sorry. Yeah. No, so so that's the early Meccan period, those six years, and then what happens is at at, at uh, year six you have another H, which is a conversion of Hamza, who is the the prophet peace be upon him, his mm -hmm. uncle, and uh, Omar, who is this young buck and in the the star um, uh, point guard for the Quraysh. And he just takes off his jersey and puts on the, the Muslim jersey. And that's a big issue for for the Quraysh at that time. And so instead of just persecuting individual people like Bilal and Sumeya, mm -hmm. they start this they start this full on uh, organized um, persecution of the entire community. So they say, you know what? And kind of like this mob mentality, the way you know, if the mob can't get to you, they'll say, well, you know what, I know where your daughter and, you, and your wife, you know, right. live. I know where your, your son goes to school. And that kind of mentality, they said, you know, Muhammad, if you're not going to stop this, we're going to just 
punish your entire clan. And so his entire clan of Hashem and Mutalib. And so that but and so that event though triggers the next quadrant, which is the the, the, the latter Meccan period. Yeah, the late Meccan period. The late Meccan period. And then that brings you so now in your clock again to twelve o'clock. Yeah, so you're now at the hour. bottom of the clock and yeah. now you're at and the Hijra. There you which go. is the H. And the Hijra is the period of time when, when it gets so bad that the Muslims leave Mecca and they, they migrate to Medina, the, a northern city about 300 miles away. So now basically if you're looking at the clock, the whole right side is now the Meccan period. So you can always remember the Meccan period is about 12, 12 years. It's actually That's a little right. bit more. Yeah. And now we're in the Medinan period, which is about 11 years. So forget about that last year. Yeah. It's about 11 years. So now like already, like that in itself, unfortunately, is like more than most people know about it the is. story of the Quran, you it's know, right. and it's so, amazing. and, yeah. and just visually, it, it's so yeah. easy to, it is. to yeah. think about it in terms of, yeah, the, and, the totality and, and of that's the, story. the beauty of it, and that's what I like, and so that, that, that's that third quadrant that we're talking about, mm-hmm. from about, you know, the bottom left quadrant, is the period of intensity, yeah. and a lot of defensive battles, because there's a lot of military um, offensives against the Muslims coming from right. the south, right, and that's the period of all these battles, yeah, and that's the, so that's the early Medinian period, and again, you know, we're not going to get into spoilers, but you have a nice little uh, mnemonic that you present mm-hmm. where you can remember literally every year getting us to the 18 o'clock. Yeah, 18 o'clock. Yeah. So then eighteen uh, the 18th hour is the other Another H. Another H. Yeah. And that's the last H, and that is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And the Treaty mm. of Hudaybiyah ends that quadrant, which is the quadrant of intense battles, okay. and ushers in a, peace, uh, a period of peace and prosperity and growth for the Muslim community, and that finally ends with the completion of the faith. So in a nutshell, it's just, you know, that alone in itself allowed me to really start doing some fun stuff. And that's where it starts getting really fun for me, is I can finally now map the revelation on the timeline. So now when you say, when was, you know, Surah Alaq, which is the first revelation, I can just put it on like a pin, like kind of pin the donkey kind of thing. You can pin the surah on the clock and like that happened all the way at one Mm o'clock. And then if you say, well, when was Surah Baqarah, which is the longest surah in the Quran, which is about a lot of intense issues, Mm -hmm. I can just pin that right at the bottom at 13 o'clock. And so now I can do a spatial arrangement of the revelations and now I can finally let the Quran happen to me. Wow. See, the people, and this is what I, you know, I write this in my, in my introductions. I wanted to, my, 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 uh, my heroes are the likes of Abu Bakr, who, uh, uh, who is, you know, the, the prophet's best friend. Right. My heroes are the likes of Imam Ali, who is the prophet's uh, family member. Um, and I always wondered, what was it like for them? They didn't read the first chapter and the second chapter and the third chapter the way we are approaching it today. They, you know, the, the second chapter wasn't revealed yeah. until much later on. Just as a little background, the way it's assembled right now is not the way, the chronological way it was revealed. Correct. And so I just thought to myself, if I want to be like these people, let me just let the Quran happen to me. The way it happened. The way it happened to them. Beautiful. Right, right. Which, yeah, and, and you already touched on it, which the order of revelation is not related to the order of compilation. Correct. So, so, so that's, yeah, going in terms of the way it's, the Qur'an is structurally, which presents problems for a lot of Western readers because mm-hmm. the Qur'an is not a narrative. It doesn't, nor are the chapters of the Qur'an, do they read like narratives. Mm-hmm. You know, there's one exception, or I always point to the, you know, the chapter of Yusuf, the mm-hmm. chapter of Joseph, mm-hmm. which is the one sort of exception to that narrative rule. Um, but speaking of narratives, we, and we got yes, into this, yes. and this, Zaki missed out on this conversation, but I think that he'd have a lot to contribute because we talked a lot about Joseph Campbell and this sort of hero narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Because I couldn't help but talk, you know, name drop Luke Skywalker, but, you know, because Lucas draws so much from, from Joseph Campbell. But talk a little bit about how that relates to this whole conversation. Okay. I don't want to... I think that's great. You're, so what's fascinating is when we were talking yesterday, you were the third person who's brought this up to me. Okay. Uh, the first, there's another person at a, a Talif event, and then when I was at RAS, there's another young guy who brought up this concept of, hey, do you know Joseph Campbell? Mm. And the first time I heard of Joseph Campbell was through my brother Majid, who's a prolific writer and a poet, who was the one who told me about this concept of the, the, the I guess it's called the hero's journey, or mm-hmm. the journey narrative. Mm-hmm. And Zucky, I, I don't know, do you, I mean, I can try to explain it the best as I can, but my... The, the hero's journey? Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm down with it. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Do you no, want to no, do no, the one sentence it, like... Yeah, he, uh, he's maybe asking you to see I mean, if you could kind of I mean, summarize it for our listeners. It's uh, it's the archetypal mm-hmm. heroic myth that no matter what era or which culture we're talking about, going back to, you know... Time immemorial. T- time yeah. immemorial. Yeah. Ancient Greece, right. uh, you know, and earlier than that. 
uh, we respond to heroic myths in a very specific way. And that myth is the, the innocent who is given the call to adventure, who then has to make a decision. And is reluctant. Right. He, right. Yeah. So he, he or she has to make a decision mm. about whether they want to leave behind the life that they know, mm. and by extension, the life of comfort, of familiarity, mm-hmm. for the sake of something new. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will take on a mentor figure during the course of that journey. They will lose that mentor figure during the course of that journey. Uh, they will yeah. successfully accomplish whatever the task is, and then they will return uh, to their place of origin. Victoria, if you will. <laughs> right. Victoria, yes, having, having achieved some kind of a transcendent experience. And obviously... The, what immediately comes to mind, which Prabhu is talking about, is, of course, the, the original Star Wars, and by that I mean just the first film, mm. which is, I mean, everything I just said, you can plot the course on that map. But it's not just that. It's The Hobbit. Not just that. It's The Lord of the Rings. Not just, uh, You name it. Um, and I keep looking at Mirage, but not just that, but it's it's the life of the prophet. Sure. I mean, it's and, the life and, of Muhammad. I and, mean, and, right? and this is exactly what we mean when we say something archetypal, right? It's, it, we respond to all of these other stories because they remind us of stories there such as that of Prophet Muhammad or, you know, Prophet Jesus or Prophet Moses. or I mean, it's these. that's what we mean by archetype. Jo- going and, back and, to the chapter of it's Joseph. In, it it's incredible. Like it's, you know, and it's, you know, just yesterday someone asked me, what is it about the, the hero narrative that we like? And I... I didn't know how to answer it except to say, what is it about campfire that we find so comforting? It's just something it's intrinsically in our DNA, in our DNA right. that we respond to these stories, which is why, you know, the Quran says that the story of Joseph is the most beautiful story told, and it's that pure narrative of the orphan child. Yeah. You know, whether you want to talk about, you know, Luke Skywalker, or you, I mean, you know, yeah. or you can bring it into the story of Joseph, who is, you know, figuratively uh, orphaned, orphaned from his father, mm-hmm. and gets thrown into a well and has a moment of deep despair. Mm-hmm. Or the moment of Jonah, who has his moment of deep despair in the belly of the whale. Mm-hmm. Or, um, so, um, and in the same way, there is there is just something intrinsically that just, just tickles your DNA when you yeah. hear this. And, and there is, to me, in my essence, and when I read the story of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an orphan. I mean, flat out an orphan, and he had the father figure uh, of his grandfather who died in about two years afterwards, and then he had another father figure. That's right. And that father figure, his name was Abu Talib, he dies in the year 10 of, his, of the Prophet's mission, and then he loses his wife also, Khatija, who was the most beloved person in his life, and probably the most beloved person to me in the story of the Prophet's life. And he has his moment in the belly of the whale. And if you actually get in the book, it's fascinating that the, actually the story of Jonah actually comes, there's a nexus in the story of Jonah and the story of Muhammad in that moment where God's reminding Muhammad about the story of Jonah to That's get right. him through and know that you're on this prophetic path. And what's fascinating, I mean, and so, you know, we could tell the whole story, but essentially, you know, it follows the story of redemption and coming back and the conquest of Mecca is one of the most beautiful moments in the entire Sira, where Muhammad comes back to Mecca and says, in the words of Joseph. That's right. Literally from the Quran. Literally, he resp- repeats, he yeah. says, in the words of Yusuf. La tathrib alaykum al yom. There, no, there is no hardship on you today. Talk about the... I forgive you for all that you've done. Talk about the power. Right. I mean, yeah. it's just great that we have a movie critic here, no. a guy who knows the actual verse, and I am just <laughs> enjoying this company right now that we're able to... <laughs> the one kind verse of I know I threw out. ...synergize here. Yeah. But um, it's, it's, it's powerful, and I think yeah. it's purposely, it's divinely scripted, powerful story. Um, it that it, you know, and I, I share this with people it, completely. I'm not ashamed to say this. I have had more moments I can count just sitting in Pete's coffee or in the coffee bean and tea leaf all around the country, just crying mm. behind my laptop, hiding from the barista. And they're just wondering who is this guy who's crying with his laptop open, and I'm just reading the story, the yeah. story, right. and the people around him, and it's just it's just overwhelming. So, yeah. um. I do want to, you know, it was yeah. fascinating. I'll just bring something up here. As Please. Zaki is talking about the hero's narrative, yeah. you know who else had that narrative? Malcolm X. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it just, uh, it just kind of triggered something in me because Malcolm X is the person who, you know, who I actually gave the opening quote to. And like, yeah. I could have gone to a lot of people for that opening quote or picked a verse from the Quran and so forth. But I chose Malcolm X for a specific reason because I feel like he's like, in many ways, we view him as our American prophet with a lowercase p. And uh, I love it. He he was orphaned. 
Yeah. And he had a father figure. And that father figure let him down. And then he went through a period of... Redemption. Well, loneliness. Oh, discovery, uh, you know, loneliness, discovery, right, right, going to jail. And, that's right. yeah. and then he had his moment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's actually the opening quote is that moment of, you know, he never, I mean, you know, not, not everyone gets the opportunity to make it all the way around the clock, as it were. A lot of people, you know, um, die a long way. But I'll just read to you this one part of the book because I just find it so powerful. This is Malcolm X uh, in his last year of his life who, for the record, was around exactly the same age I am now. Just to put things in the context of how powerful these humans wow, were and what they right. did. With, yeah. He said, here I am back in Mecca. So he's writing this when he was in making his pilgrimage to Mecca. After all he's been through in the hero narrative, he's finally gone. He says, here I am back in Mecca. I'm still traveling, trying to broaden my mind, for I've seen too much of the damage narrow-mindedness can make of things. And when I return home to Mecca, I will devote whatever energies I have to repair the damage. Mm. So he was a guy on a trajectory, and you know, unfortunately, that trajectory got cut short. Sure. But uh, it's a hero's narrative. I think there's sure. something powerful about that. Mm. So, um, wow. So I mean, yeah. I, so now I think that kind of brings us to uh, in the time that we have remaining mm-hmm. uh, to kind of where you are now. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, well, you talked about, for example, introducing the book to Dr. Jackson and and having Dr. Jackson write the forward, which I think you described in another presentation that I heard as sort of like taking, I don't know, four years in the making or something, or maybe more than that. I don't yeah, know. just to make sure we could get him to do it. There but it go. was worth every second of Oh, it's a beautiful forward. Um, yeah. But, but um, so now, once you are ready to publish, or you mm-hmm. feel that the book is ready mm-hmm. to publish, so like you described it as the fourth edition, mm-hmm. um, you take it to other scholars as well. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe talk Absolutely. about a few people? Uh, I know, like, Imam Suhaib's written about it, and... We can name drop. It's okay. So feel feel feel, feel <laughs> okay. free if you're um, at liberty to do so. Uh, no, I'm at. Yeah. They're on the back cover of the book and in the <laughs> book, so I have no problem yeah, doing please. that. Please. Um, yeah. You know, I think I throughout this entire process, I was acutely aware and continue to be acutely aware of my uh, uh, lack of pedigree in writing about something like this. You know, so and I'll tell you right now, as a physician. The first book I would pass on is another book written by another physician. So, you know, these know it all. Like, and so I very another book written by a physician, not about medicine. Not about medicine. There you go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. uh, And and a book written about religion specifically. You know, I probably would pass on that. But so I'm aware of that. And so it was very important to me. You know, one thing I will say in this book is that I have tried my very best to put to have none of my voice in the book whatsoever. And so the way I describe the book is I say, you know what, every tree is like a book on the prophet's life. And there's a we tend to just drive by these these orchards and just lo- admire them from the road, but never go into the orchard and like pluck a fruit. Mm-hmm. And so what I did for the last 13 years is I not didn't go to just one tree, but I went to 10 of the best trees and plucked all the best fruit hmm. and slight and put it in a basket. But then I, and that was the first edition, but then I realized, you know what, even that people won't eat the fruit. I got to slice it for people and like make it like very presentable and then maybe they'll start eating it because once they eat it, you know, that fruit's going to do a body good, you know, and that's how I felt about it. Um, So in that process, knowing that, you know, why would anyone read a book by a physician uh, if I wouldn't, um, I was very uh, quickly uh, started towards the tail end of the process. You know, no one knew about this book as I was writing it because I didn't know what it was and it was really just for me. Um, but as I realized that I have something that might not exist right now as a resource and could be helpful to people, I started sending out preview copies to some of the scholars who I respect and admire. And I felt that um, they really, I needed to make sure that this book was completely vetted within the community that I trust and grew up in. So the people that I'm talking about foremost are, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf who's uh, reviewed the book and endorsed it on the back cover, and Imam Zaid Chakar, who's just been incredibly gracious with his review of the book and saying it's one of the most important books on the Prophet's life in the English language. Mm-hmm. Um, Imam uh, Saheb Webb, who's teaching from it, mm-hmm. and um, you know, Ubaidullah Evans, a very good friend of mine, very fantastic guy, who he, he, you know, he was one of those moments where he texted me, he said, you know what, I saw this book, I feel like I was like, looking at the internet for the first time. 
Wow. And so I said, hey, can I actually put that in the book? Because it was just such a cool way of him <laughs> seeing it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's what Azur Osman the other day is a good friend of mine and just one of my favorite podcasts. One of my favorite episodes, by the way, was his. Oh, that was the Azur show guest starring us. <laughs> oh, my God. We made a cameo one, at the beginning. You know what's funny? Yeah. I remember all the, I was actually riding on a rental bus listening. To, I can I don't know why. I just remember yeah, everywhere yeah, I'm yeah, at. Yeah, where, where Azur you Osman is like dropping just major heavy pearls on the subwoof and everything. And I'm just like... Wow, I've learned more than the halakha just listening to this, com- you know, <laughs> quote comedian, you know. That's right. And yeah. um, but incredibly, just uh, a, 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 a and, dear, and, a, and a great friend of all. Yeah, yeah. No, just that, was like a, that was one of those things person. where I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna sit and listen because there's nothing. In part, can, in part, I can't play on that level, yeah. right? So no, yeah, to shoot I, that's what Jordan that's what I, was like. I'll just <laughs> stand back. No, he's just uh, you, you know, God's blessed him with many talents, right? Um, and he. Um, so, um, so he said, he, I think he texted something and he just said, revelation just broke the internet. So it was just like that kind of cute stuff. I appreciate that because you know, the, the thing is I, I admire these people so much. They don't know how much of an impact that they have had on me. You know, I've just mailed out a couple of books to one of my heroes, the Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. And you know, so I've been having this opportunity to really reach out to these people. Um, Dr. Dr. Brown and at Georgetown, you know, people like that who I really admire, respect. Dr. Omar, who's probably you know up there right next to Dr. Jackson. These are yeah, the giants of my. Right. And so to, to 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 me, my spiritual journey right now has been to see. Um, uh, 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 I don't know how else to put it, but just God's uh, um, hand in all this grace yeah, and hand. Grace. I mean, there are so many places where I could have gone totally in a wrong direction, and mm. God totally blocked it. Mm-hmm. And what's wow. fascinating, just, you know, people sometimes say, like, well, how did you write it for 13 years? You know, the truth is, it's not like I was writing it in an ivory tower for 13 years without eating. You know, I was going through life and so forth. And I had a lot of roadblocks and disappointments. And the only thing that got me through this long journey was actually the subject material that I was writing about itself. Yeah. And that's the difference is that, like, actually I was getting fuel and material about how to deal with the disappointments I was dealing with as I was writing the book, mm. with how the subject matter I was actually writing about dealt with disappointments and loneliness and successes and heartaches and waiting for your ship to come in, all those concepts. Right. Um, so it's just been, it's been a fascinating personal journey also. Right. And uh, it's a couple of things I want to say. So it's funny you mentioned about, like, not wanting to read another book by a, a, a physician written about a mm-hmm. non-medical yeah, subject matter. Because I remember, I think before we met, so I, I, I get a text from someone saying, oh, you know, you have to meet Dr. So-and-so. He's written this new book, which I think is going to be, it's, it's a great book, and I think you'll love it. That was all. It was very sort of ambiguous in terms of what the book was about, who you were, anything like that. This is before we met. And so in my mind, the same thought process, which was, oh, this is probably going to be another book written by a doctor about like the, you know, scientific miracles of the Quran mm. or the how Muslims, uh, you know, the, the, the material culture that is the, the, the Muslim civilization produced. And again, not, not trying to be cynical or, or, or you know, of, of any of the other books that you find written by doctors about <laughs> these very subjects. Am I going to be the only doctor on the show now? The first and the last I, I, I doctor so. on the pad We're going out podcast. in a blaze of glory, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're torching the bridge. I apologize to all my brothers and sisters <laughs> out there. <laughs> no, but, you know, so, so like, you know, honestly, that's what I thought. And it, was, it wasn't until, one, meeting you, and two, then just seeing your passion for the book and, mm-hmm. and, and, and hearing you talk about the book with me and then sharing an early manuscript of it with me and then just going home and, and sort of absorbing it. And I was like, okay, I, we're sitting on something. I mean, if I, you know, if I can be, if I could lower the water line, which is something we like to say around here at Tatleef, like, the, you know, um, and be sort of, you know, uh, raw which and real, which is that, yeah, I mean, in just absorbing it and taking my time to delve into it myself, I said, we're really on to something special. And then, you know, you, like you mentioned your brother and you mentioned, and I think you do yourself, if I may, a slight disservice when you just say you're a medical doctor or that's all, or that you were raised in sort of this athletic academic vein, because I think that one of the things that has struck me meeting you and your family is I, I describe you as sort of like modern sort of, describe you and your brother as sort of modern polymaths. Mm. <laughs> They're, no, seriously. Like, or AKA Renaissance men, but oh, okay. Ren- Renaissance men is... I was like, is it painful? No, it's... <laughs> Polymath sounds like. So- <laughs> is it painful? 
<laughs> something you, you, you go to a doctor yeah, and he says, like, oh, yeah, turn around and take call it. Take a of polymathitis <laughs> yeah, there. That's right, that's take right. two of these and no, no, good no. luck with that. Uh, <laughs> AKA, well, Renaissance men is such a loaded term, that's why. Anyway, so uh, and by, by that I, I mean... I appreciate that. Yeah. No, I mean, because, you know, poet slash carpenter slash author slash... Writes Kawalis on the side. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you and yeah, your brother no, together in one. Uh, no, 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 no. But and, anyway. But uh, anyway, yeah. So yeah. the point is, um, I, I think that it's it's wonderful that, no, that we've that. had your contribution to this field. And like I said, you know, if, if my endorsement means anything to the listeners, uh, I will say, like I said, in my real honest-to-God opinion, it's a game changer in terms of the series presented. Um, and I'm super excited to sort of go over it, unpack it, if you will, mm-hmm. with my 13 year old now and, and mm-hmm. just sort of have her, you know, and, and sort of share that passion that is so apparent in the book. So um, bring us to what you're doing now. Now you're, you're obviously here. You're visiting us here in Northern California. Yeah. Uh, but you're here because, you know, you gave a presentation. Let me one. just hey, if you don't mind, I'm no. going to just jump in because there, there's something I have to like say about this person. Uh, and the story because before I would feel Please. remiss if I drive away and not mention this and this is something that I think is that um, one thing that I learned in this journey is that this story about this individual it's not it just doesn't stop with him it's really about the people who are around him mm-hmm. and I just felt like I have to get that off my chest because that's kind of my the biggest message that I have is that I discovered when I say I was crying in these coffee shops, yeah. it wasn't always because of something that Muhammad the prophet said. It was actually how these companions who at one point in their lives in early Mecca were really either nobodies or some of them were somebodies, but they had a political or financial agendas over a period of 10, 15, 20 years completely got out of their own way and became these giants. Yes. And I give examples of like Abdullah bin Masood or Salman al Farsi, or and this, 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 the tendency that we tend to have when we read the text and say, oh, that's an evil guy and that's a hero, is a very um, provincial understanding and not mm-hmm. really, quote, unpacking the humanness of these people. And the secret for me uh, is to find myself in someone like Abu Sufyan. Because sure. mm. he had personalities that were human, and he was an, he was a noble person. He was he was a good guy in some ways. He just had financial incentives and other issues that prevented him from adhering to the message sooner than others. And I just want to say this one thing is that like I have found that like for me the secret sauce has been to attach myself to some people who I find their personality jives with mine and see how they played played their life out. Mm. Sure. And um, it's something I invite readers to do real quick. Is that, you know, in my introduction, I say, there, there I give the example of Safwan. Safwan ibn Umayyah is this guy who tried to kill, have the Prophet assassinated and fought with him and so forth. It took him 20 years to finally look at this individual eye to eye, like toe to toe. And when he finally turned completely and faced this individual, he just melted in front of him because huh. he fell in love with this person. Yeah. And I found that for myself. That's been my story. Is that I've been avoiding it. I haven't been fighting it, but I've just kind of been avoiding it because I gotta like get to the next degree. Yeah. I've been avoiding the relationship because I need to like move on and take care of other stuff. And I've never looked fully eye to eye with this person. And my my guess is that if those of us who are interested in actually just taking a moment, look eye to eye with him. You know, you have people like Salman Al Farsi who took twenty years searching for this guy. Right. Who is this prophet? You know, is prophesized to meet. He took twenty years wandering throughout Arabia and 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 so forth. Yeah. The Levant to find him, and he finally found him. So that was one journey. And then you have the story of Safwan, who was ne- next to this person's entire life, and didn't, but isn't looking eye to eye. But when both these people look at him in the eyes, mm-hmm. you can't stop. So yeah. just had to get that out, just because I no, think that's, that's, beautiful. that's kind it of is. Yeah. that's it is. the point. Yeah, no, us, it is. You know. It is beautiful, and and the people around him and how they're inspired by him and. Like, I mean, you go back to your personal hero that you mentioned earlier, Abu Bakr Siddiq, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. his, his journey is a beautiful yeah. one in a sense of, like, I, well, well, one can, if you were going to assign, like, a, val- like a, a reason for his, the, for him being who he is, mm. in terms of his commitment, his, mm-hmm. pa- you know, it, it's the prophet. <laughs> it's the love of the prophet, right? Like, you're yeah. saying, you know. Well, by the time he says something like, I mean, you you give a beautiful example about you know facing him facing his son yeah. at the battle of uh, of, at the of battle of Badr. Badr. yeah. 
By then, how much Quran has he read? I mean, let's be real, right? I mean, yeah. he, I mean, he hasn't heard more. these major surahs. That we are the first, the second, third, fourth surahs. He's bare. The, a lot of them haven't. Come. Haven't even. Been, that's right. And so it's the love and the sohba, what we say that the the just the companionship yeah. of the prophet that makes. And him... I think that I'm glad you mentioned that mm-hmm. because I think at the end, yeah, you know, and I tell this to readers, and yeah. I think you know, kind of my extrapolation of Dr. Jackson's kind of mentorship. It's, this is not supposed to be an academic exercise. Yeah, you can start it, and you should treat you take it with that mm-hmm. skill set or whatever. But I found out, and I say this very clearly: that this is a love story. <coughs> and if wow. you're really gonna get into this, you're gonna start falling in love. But you have to come with your heart open, mm-hmm. or and if not, even then, a lot of times your heart's gonna get open, even if you try right, not to. Right. But um, these people loved this person, and like I was saying, you know, Sheikh Yasser Fazaga down in, in in Southern California says the 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 hallmark of love. The word love has been mentioned over ninety times in the Quran, and he says it doesn't really define the word love, but it talks about the first manifestation of love. And the first manifestation of love, when you truly love someone. Is commitment, right? And that's what I'm finding for myself now: is how committed am I? Mm-hmm. You know, do I love this guy because I'm in a culture of love for him, which is most of you know. I was in that place where everyone loves him, yeah. or they say they love him, so I love him. Yeah. Or do I really love this person more? And now, as I kind of deepen that love for him, I'm finding myself doing things which I thought the mirage of five years ago would be like kind of unreasonable. Like you'd really go do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. You spend your time or your money or your resources for this person but yeah you know when you start loving that person you start beginning to love everything that he loves so. right so so yeah okay. i mean th- no thank you for that and and but to to kind of maybe wrap mm-hmm. up um you're here in northern california yeah. because now you're being invited by communities to mm-hmm. come and they want you to present on the book and mm-hmm. to do like sort of book signings yeah. oh, sorry book, book, book uh, launches if sure you sure yeah talk, tell us a little bit about where you are in that in that process so in that process so right now yeah. we you know i i'm based out of uh, phoenix arizona and so we've done um we first launched to our local community because that's 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 the coaching plan as it were you know i'm trying to follow the coaching plan of the prophet peace be upon himself so just kind of talk to my family and friends first uh, we went to Chicago after that, actually during Malcolm X week, which was an incredible experience because that's a whole other story for mm-hmm. another time. Um, but, um, and then we've come, we've come to Ta'lif, which mm-hmm. is probably the most amazing spiritual, one of the most amazing spiritual experiences of uh, my life, mm-hmm. actually, to talk to a retreat full of converts and, you know, new converts, three days old and okay. 20 years old, and dealing with the issues that they're dealing with. Because all of these people in the Sira were... Converts. converts you know so it's just like an amazing story yeah. there's nowhere else i would rather be than in that room with those people mm. we've come back now again to talif we went to mcc in the bay we're going to be going to zaytuna in, in april i think uh, 22nd and okay. then we're planning on doing the east coast which will take a break during the summer for ramadan and so forth yeah. and then we're going to go back to the east coast okay. hopefully and and to europe and the far east um, great great so, um we haven't even talked about yeah, but uh, like in terms of uh, one of the things I did want to talk about, but we can maybe save this for mm-hmm. a, another conversation or you, your, your decision to self-publish. But I yeah. know that is something that you find that you think that you do want to touch on. Yeah, absolutely. So we, of, you know, at this process, yeah. while I was writing this book, like yeah. again, for many years, I was just going to Xerox these and hand them out to my friends and that was <laughs> it. That was the way I was thinking about it. When I finally realized that we're onto something here, yeah. um, I had talked to a few publishers, but what I realized quickly is that the people I was talking to, a, I, understandably, they didn't understand what I was trying to create, you know, and um, they didn't want to necessarily spend the resources on the book in terms of production quality uh, that I wanted to do. So, for example, their publishers said, "Oh, we'll do it, but it's got to be in black and white." And I, none of the books that I've mastered are in black and white. They're beautiful. So we finally just decided. So it's like a deal breaker. It was a deal breaker. Yeah. So yeah. my wife and I, and my wife, I'll just say, has just been incredible in this entire journey of bringing this to where it is today, and. Just for the listeners to know, there's an entire team behind this. I have right. a lawyer and graphic designer, and there's a whole, I mean, editors, just amazing, huge team behind this project. And um, we just decided, you know what? We have the vision. Let's just pour, you know, my own personal resources and just start our own company. And so, you know, we the things that were important to us, for example, is that we made sure that it was locally printed. We didn't want to increase the carbon footprint to print it in 
you know, wherever in the yeah. east and with their, you know, and ship it over here unnecessarily, even if it was cheaper. It. So we wanted to kind of stay within the integrity of the topic itself. And we yeah. felt that the Prophet, peace be upon himself, would want to keep this carbon footprint low. Mm. But we wanted to put what's called Ihsan or try to make this as perfect as possible. Yeah. So we wanted the cover to be beautiful. So, you know, me and my graphic designer and my wife, we actually went down to the printing uh company which is in phoenix arizona and we like touched the papers we made sure is this acid free where is this ink from so Beautiful. you know people ask me you know why you know about the price point and so forth and you know i just want them to know we have tried to make this the tradition of the everything about the book the cover itself we put a lot of time into it we just want to be beautiful yeah. you know people used to look at the prophet peace be upon him and just stare because he was so beautiful and that's why i told my graphic designer i want the cover to be to emblemize that so people just want to own the book just to stare at the cover yeah. so wonderful so I hope I mean I, I no, hope no, that, that and, it is. Is, is like, and I mean where can people yeah, find the book online the book? Uh, so they can go to www.revelationthebook.com okay. um, and uh, they'll get all the information that they can there's kind of a portal and I'll send you the book is available um, through our primary distributor Mecca Books and then it's also available on Amazon and yes. around the world through bookstores local retailer bookstores around the world wonderful yeah. and look out for Mirage coming to your local community where you can get that book uh, signed God willing as I have yeah. so yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah uh, and where can people find you I mean if they want to maybe either engage you or find out more about so again doing. just go to the website yeah. www.revelationthebook.com just right. there's a contact page you can email us and it'll be me or someone else will get back to you and we are. We'll come. We would be happy to come out to your community. We're not trying to sell a book. We're actually trying to create a possibility of that's coming right. back to something beautiful. So that's what we're trying to. We're trying to do here. Right. So you're right. open to invitations to other communities. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great. So that's that's the way you can reach out to yeah. Mirage directly. Um, last but not least, I, mm -hmm. I do want to uh, future plans in terms of maybe supplements to the book. I know. Uh, your brother and I, if I can name drop, yeah. we, we, I have my wish list of like, if he wants to do like an a, a accompanying burda to the book, I, I'd be, sign me up. So, well, well, any future plans like that? Uh, yeah, well, you nailed it there. <laughs> I mean, that's something that we, I hope uh, we're sure. planning on working together. I think there's a whole, we want to, we want to really be part of, of your, of what you guys are doing in terms of creating American culture. That's what I think this podcast is about documenting and creating in the documentation of that American culture. You know, that's something that I think my brother is also passionate about and I want to help him. And yes. other young people, you know, there are a lot of amazing scholars and artists out there that we are now creating this platform uh, that's now being used around the world to just really have the best and the brightest people. So, mm. you know, but we have to, you know, we have a lot of work to do still. You know, the thing is I actually still have a full-time job, which is kind of challenging. <laughs> I'm negotiating this yeah. new journey in my life. But, yeah. you know, we are being asked to do workbooks for high schools and, you know, junior high schools Excellent. and elementary schools and posters and you know, maybe there'll be flashcards, maybe there'll be an internet portal and so forth. So Beautiful. we're kind of, it's growing faster than we expected. And we're hoping that with good help, we're going to be able to kind of meet the needs of the community. Well, Godspeed, man. Godspeed yeah, with all that's that. awesome. Thank, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on and talking with mm -hmm. us. I mean, it's beyond just learning about the process. I mean, it was just a f fascinating conversation. So we appreciate it. It's my pleasure. No, I'm yeah. honored that you guys would have me here. No, so it's thank you so been much. a pleasure. And it, I, frankly, it's been, yeah, I, I've just had a joy. It's been a great, very engaging conversation. So. Just breeze by. Yeah, it did breeze by. Yeah. Um, people can reach out to us uh, for comments and feedbacks to us, uh, questions, what have you. Go to um, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. Uh, go to uh, email us at diffuse congruence at gmail.com. We are at iTunes. We are at Stitcher Radio. We're at TuneIn Radio. Wherever you find podcasts, we are there. So please do write a review, leave a star rating. Do you, guys, do you guys mind if I grab the guitar from you just to play out the, out, the outgoing riff here? There you go. It's all yours. Okay. Take it away. Take this it away. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody.